everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Growing in the Kootenays webinar. My name is Lori Frankham. I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the Central Kootenay Invasive Species Society. So thank you so, so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to start off today by getting to know a little bit about the folks that are on the line here with us. So I'm going to launch a poll just to get an idea of what your current guardian experience is, is. So if you wouldn't mind going through the questions. So it should be up there. Sarah, can you see that poll? I can. Okay, great. So we're going to leave this open for about a minute. There's four simple questions. So if you guys wouldn't mind um, going through and giving us your response, we'll give you a minute, get, get People, people are still joining us here. Okay, so for folks that are just joining us, if you could just take a minute to fill out this poll. We'll leave it open for about another 30 seconds. Great, we've had great response to this webinar. We've had over a hundred people register. So people are keen on growing flowers, which is great. Okay, well, five more seconds. Okay, so I'm just gonna see, we'll see who we have. Okay, so Sarah, can you see the results there on your screen? I can, yeah, it looks okay. like keen gardeners here. Yes, so everyone here is already has some form of a gardener. Flower gardening experience, we have beginner, intermediate, one advanced. Uh, we have a pretty big, basically a split of who's currently growing cut flowers. So we have a mix um, half down and we'll have a look at people that are aware of the Plant Wise or Grow Me Instead program. So only 12% are aware of it. So that's a big um, point of this webinar is to make you aware of the, uh, the Plant Wise program. So great, thanks for sharing that with me. Okay, so is the poll gone, Sarah? Can you not see it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's gone. Okay, great. So you can get to the next slide there, that would be great. Whoops, it just came back. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we get into the content, just a couple of housekeeping items. So I see a couple of people have turned on their video. Um, just to keep the screen nice and clean for folks, we would just appreciate if you did keep your video off, um, as well as your mute button off. This just helps um, with the visual part of, of the presentation. However, we do want to make this interactive. So if you did have a question or a comment um, for those, there's a little chat box near the bottom of your screen. So hit that, just be aware that the way that it's set is that everyone's going to be able to see those comments and questions. So you can change the setting too, and you can make it um, uh, setting just to, so you'll see a name called Lori Carr. So Lori, give everyone a wave. She's another CKIS member. She's going to be managing our chat box for us. Um, so definitely, send them through. We will get through the presentation first and we'll try to get through as many questions at the end as possible. Uh, so I'm going to keep in mind this webinar is being recorded and it is going to be available online. So if you miss something and you want to revisit it, you can definitely watch it again or share it with other friends and family. There is going to be a follow-up email sent out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Um, a lot of resources will be sent out in there. So if you're a note taker, by all means take notes, but there is going to be an email follow-up sent out as well. In that email, there is going to be a survey. Um, your feedback is really important to our organization. It helps with our education outreach initiatives. Um, and as a thank you for filling it out, you'll be put into a draw to win one of Stone Meadow Garden's beautiful bouquets, but it will be a summer bouquet. Uh, Sarah's telling me that the spring bouquets are flying out the door um, because of Mother's Day. So that's great news. Okay, so next slide there. Um, so before I introduce Sarah, I just want to let you guys know a little bit about our organization. Like I said, my name's Lori. I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the Central Kootenay Invasive Species Society. So this is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2005. And our vision is to protect our ecosystems and communities by preventing and reducing the harmful impacts um, of invasive species. 
And prevention is the cheapest and most effective tool in our toolbox. And that's why we do do education and outreach um, to, for programs like the PlantWise program that I will be talking about later in our program. So next slide there, please, Sarah. So I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce our guest speaker for the day. Um, Sarah Kistner is the talented co-owner of Stowe Meadow Gardens, a little flower farm in Terry's, BC, not Thrums, Terry's, make that clear. <laughs> so in between, and if you find yourself in between Castlegar and Nelson, definitely stop by, um, especially if their farm stands open to grab one of their beautiful bouquets. Um, so Sarah and her husband do specialize in growing cut flowers and they do so with gusto and passion. Sarah comes to us with over 20 years of gardening experience and we're so excited that she's going to share some tips on how we can bring the beauty of our garden indoors. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, it's exciting to see we have so many gardeners that are keen on getting their flower gardens in gear, although it sounds like lots of you are already um, you know, already going down that path, but we just thought we could share a little bit about what we've learned here um, on our farm. So right off the bat, can I go cut flowers in the Kootenays? Well, that's a definitive yes, absolutely. Um, you can see this is a photo here of um, our dahlia patch in the end of summer. Um, and you may know that we're uh, keen on growing dahlias here. It's one of our main crops. So it's, this is when I'm in my, my glory here. So getting started. Well, obviously this is a huge topic and we don't have that much time today. So we're gonna have to just sort of glance over the, the general, um, just begin, skim the surface of this, I guess. Um, so I thought we should really start off with the fundamentals of knowing how do you choose what you wanna grow in your cut flower garden. So to have a nice, beautiful garden, um, we wanna try to have a lot of different types of flowers in different categories, and I'll talk about what that means, um, so that you can have blooms all season long. As we are planning our garden, we think about a few different things. When is it gonna flower throughout the whole season? Um, is it an annual or a perennial that will kind of guide us to how we're, um, you know, what areas we're gonna plant in um, and what needs the plant has? And then what type of bloom is it? Because we're also looking for different kinds of flowers. Um, if we wanna make a beautiful arrangement, um, we wanna have some that are big and fancy and showy and others that are kind of more the, the supporting background characters. So it's, there's a lot to think about there when you're getting your garden planted, but if you kind of look at those few questions, it can point you in the right direction. So I wanted to put this slide up to give you an example of um, a late bouquet, a late spring bouquet here in the Kootenays. And when you look at that bouquet, you can see that we have lots of different kinds of flowers in there. We have annuals, we have perennials, um, we have some foraged greens that we got off of our property. There's actually some herbs in there. Um, there's bulbs. And so looking at this just gives you an idea of how you want to be able to, by having lots of different kinds of plants in your garden throughout the whole season, that you can make a really nice, beautiful, big, balanced bouquet. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and it sounds like lots of you are already gardening, so this might be already pretty familiar for you, but I think it's really important um, foundation of deciding how you're going to grow your garden. So here we grow lots of annuals. Um, annuals only live for one season. You're going to plant them. They're going to grow basically from seed to seed in one season. Hardy annuals can tolerate some light frosts. They're also an annual, but they're great for this area because they do like the cool weather more. Uh, then we have perennials. So these are going to live for many seasons. You can see in the picture there, um, those are delphiniums. Um, often with perennials, they do have sort of a lifespan. You'll find that over time they can sort of crowd themselves and you'll need to either dig them up and divide them um, or some just sort of will peter out over time. Um, they might, might self-seed themselves, but like, for example, columbines, that one individual plant over time, it kind of just seems to, to fade away a bit, but it might be replaced by a new one that it has seeded for itself. Um, then we have biennials. So they're just gonna grow leaves and roots in the first season, and then they're gonna flower the next season. And they tend to be more spring, early summer flowering. Um, and then we've got bulbs, corms, and tubers. 
this is a huge category. There's lots of stuff that falls into that category. You know, you have your obvious spring bulbs like tulips and daffodils. Um, but then we also grow a lot of corms, like the ranunculus that we grow are from a corm, tubers, we've got dahlias. Um, and you'll find in this category, we have some that are hardy and some that need to be lifted every season. Your daffodils can stay in the ground year after year after year. Again, as a perennial like that, you usually need to dig them up and divide them over time just so that they can have enough room to really establish themselves and grow. Um, but for example, the dahlia tubers that we grow, they're not hardy enough to make it through our winters. So every fall, we have to dig them up and we divide them and then we replant them the next spring. So it's definitely a big commitment there, but it's well worth it if you have the space to keep them stored somewhere over the winter, they're, they're a great plant to have. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to mention with bulbs, if you're using them for cut flowers, you'll find that some, you can cut over and over again and it doesn't affect the health of the plant. However, something like a tulip, when we harvest that tulip, we're taking all, all the foliage is attached to that stem. And so when you cut it, if you cut it long like you would for a cut flower, um, you're removing all the means for that plant to be able to photosynthesize and regenerate that bulb to flower again the next season. So often tulips are just one and done. We, we replant them every year. Um, a lily is another example where if you just leave it be, it will come back year after year. But again, all the foliage is attached to that main stem. So if you cut it down really low on the, on the plant itself, it's not going to have enough energy to regenerate itself for the next year. It will come back, but often you won't get a very good flower. So we tend to have um, maybe two separate beds where we harvest the lilies one year and then the next year we let them regrow and we have another bed that we kind of alternate. Um, and shrub, shrubs and trees. These are a great addition to your landscape and they're often really great for using um, in making seasonal arrangements. In the spring, lots of trees, as we can see right now, we're surrounded by beautiful, you know, flowering cherries and all the fruit trees. Um, but they're also great for using the greens and the leaves if you want to make a bouquet or an arrangement. Um, they add interest and beauty to your landscape. They provide habitat for insects and pollinators, as well as birds and snakes can hide under there. So they're a really great thing to have in your garden. Um, and then often in the fall, they also have berries and really interesting things to add um, to your arrangements. And really quickly, I wanted to mention growing herbs in your cut flower garden. Um, both annual and perennial herbs can be just a super addition to your bouquets. Um, and to your landscape. They're usually really hardy, they tend to be drought tolerant, they tend to be really prolific, and they also can attract pollinators. And in this bouquet you can see we've got big heads of dill in there. Um, and it, at, people are always looking at that wondering, is that really, is that dill in there? It looks like a firework explosion or something. They're, they're just really fun and you can also use things like mint or bee balm, the greenery makes a great addition to bouquets and it gives you a nice like greenery foundation to build your arrangements from. So as you're considering all these different types of categories of flowers, um, the main thing you want to think about is the variety. Not all flowers are created equal. So number one, we will talk about this here in a second, but will it thrive in our region? Obviously that's important for us here because we do live in a challenging climate for gardening so we really have to be looking out for what's going to do well here. Obviously if you're growing cut flowers we look for things that have long stems. We also look for things that are double flowering. Um, where's my pointer? Here we go. So you can see in this picture here these are zinnias and what I mean by double flowering is if you look closely you can see there's lots of petals around there. Um, there's, you know, for example, a, a calendula might be something that a lot of people are familiar with. Often the ones that you find commonly, um, they just sort of have a single set of petals around, whereas a lot of the varieties we choose are double flowering. So they'll have multiple sets of petals and not only does it make them more beautiful, but I think it tends to make them last longer in flower arrangements. 
Um, and then obviously we're looking for a long base life. Um, if you're a home gardener or you're even a florist or someone who's, you know, maybe you're growing cut flowers for more event work, um, it's not, you can get away with a little bit more, but if you're like us, we're growing bouquets and we're bringing them to market or the grocery store or here at our farm stand, and we want to make sure they're going to be really long lasting for our customers. Um, there's lots of beautiful things out there, like for example, a oriental poppy or a bread seed poppy. They're just gorgeous flowers, but if you ever try cutting them, you just, they wilt right away. So obviously we try to stay away from those. Um, but in your home garden, you can get away with a little bit more, like for example, lilacs are a great cut flower. They're not great for maybe a market bouquet, um, but they're great if you're gonna just cut it and use it fresh right away and maybe it only lasts three days, but that might be just fine if you're having a party, looks great on the table. Um, and then another thing we look for, this isn't true with all the flowers that we grow, but that it's cut and come again. So that means once we clip a stem off, more grow back. Obviously, that's a terrific feature. So most importantly, is it suited for our climate? You've really got to get to know what your climate is like. In this picture here, you can see, you know, this was just early, early this spring. We've got snow in the mountains. There's probably snow in the mountain right behind the garden there. Um, you've got to know your climate. The Coonies is a diverse area, so even you know just within this region here, we're going to have different first and last frost dates. So I encourage you to to learn what those are. Ask your neighbors if you don't know, um, and know your hardiness zone because this is really going to dictate what you can grow there. So your hardiness zone, for those who don't know, it, it looks like most of you probably would already know this, but you know that's your coldest minimum temperature in the winter. It doesn't necessarily pertain to what your climate is like as far as, you know, here we are in the Kootenays, we can have a really hot, dry summer, but we also can have a long, snowy winter. So you could have a really cold, like we're usually at zone five here, bordering almost on six sometimes. Um, a colder one is a zone three, but that doesn't mean you won't have a long, hot summer too. So knowing your hardiness zone and then knowing your first and last frost dates are gonna help you decide what you can successfully grow here. And then knowing your specific area, how hot does it get? Are you tucked up on a mountain where you tend to be more shady or cool? Um, these are all really important things to know to help you decide how to choose what to grow. Oh, okay, here's some slides of, um, our perennials and biennials. I just wanted to quickly go through some of our favorites. This is a foxglove here, and that's a biennial. We've got yarrow, lots of different colors, super hardy, drought tolerant. Um, and at the end, like Lori said, we are gonna hand out, or uh, well, I guess we'll virtually hand out um, some information, and we're gonna list a lot of these plants for you in all the different categories. So. Uh, don't feel like you have to have this all in your head right now. We've got delphiniums, absolute stunner, love those. Um, this is called oryngium, and so these are all perennials here. And echinops. Then we've got some hardy annuals. Here's a purple peony poppy. Can't cut it, won't really last in a vase for more than a day, but makes awesome, beautiful pods. I use them green in arrangements, or um, they're fantastic dried too. We've got, here's a double flowering calendula. This is Larkspur. And so in a minute, I'm gonna talk about um, deciding what you wanna grow and looking at these different types, like when you can plant these things. So these are all hardy annuals. We can plant these um, almost as soon as the snow melts. Uh, we've got some Rudbeckia, all different varieties of Rudbeckia, and straw flowers. That's another hardy annual. And obviously you can see here, we've got it drying in our farm stand. It also makes a terrific cut flower, a dried flower as well, I mean. Then we've got the warm season annuals. Everybody loves a good sunflower. We've got cosmos, 
marigolds often kind of overlooked as a cut flower, but really they last really long. They're big, they're fluffy, they fill out a bouquet and they're really just bright and cheery. Um, zinnias. If you're not growing zinnias, you should be growing zinnias. <laughs> and uh, I'll hand it over to Lori here for a minute to talk about the PlantWise program. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Okay, so you might be thinking to yourself, you know, well, invasive plants, you know, why should I care? Um, so as a gardener, you should care because the characteristics that invasive plant, they can be a nightmare to try to eradicate from your garden if they do get introduced. Um, invasive plants tend to be prolific seed producers with really long lasting seed banks mm -hmm. and they outcompete um, generally what you have there because they lack any natural predators. Um, on a global scale, um, a big reason to not uh, introduce any invasives into your garden is invasive species are the number two threat to biodiversity globally. Um, this is because their ability to outcompete native species for resources, and this in turn is going to impact wildlife habitat and overall ecosystem health. So there's some really big environmental implications um, once invasives are introduced. As well, there's some economic implications. There's also some social impl implications to invasive species introduction. So this is where the PlantWise program was born. Um, so the horticulture industry has been identified as a vector of spread um, of invasive plants. Believe it or not, we're still finding invasive plants for sale in garden centers. So this is a provincial-wide program designed for both the horticulture industry as well as consumers and really trying to encourage folks um, for safe not to use um, invasive species. So you'll see some examples here. There's like periwinkle, scotch broom, yellow flag iris. They're all gorgeous, but they do, there are listed as invasive species so they can jump the garden fence and start causing some negative impacts um, to society. Um, so this program was invented as a prevention method. So some tips of, uh, of plant-wise is the first one, pretty simple, know what you grow and select non-invasive plants. So you just wanna be really suspicious of exotic plants, bulbs, seeds um, that are promoted as fast spreaders, vigorous self-seeders, sometimes even drought-resistant plants um, are invasive. Uh, so just those are sort of some alarm bells to go off if you see that about um, some species. The other one is just to be really wary of using fly, um, wildflower mixes. A lot of times we are seeing invasive seed mixed in with some of these other seeds. So either make sure that it's clearly labeled or make your very own seed mix. Um, in the Kootenays, we're really lucky. They're kin seed. They gather native seed and have native seed packs for sale. And we'll include that information in the, in the handout um, at the end. And the last one is to be aware of priority species. So if you wouldn't mind just flicking to that next slide there. Um, so yeah, so basically the Grow Me Instead program, there's resources out. They've, they've identified the top 26 most unwanted plants and then recommended alternatives. Um, so there's tangible things. We see KISS, we go around to garden centers. We, we have this available. We typically would be going to the Nelson Garden Fest this weekend, but given the pandemic, we're not, so there is tangible ones, but there's lots of online resources as well. So if you go to beplantwise.ca, tons of things online. There's also an app you can put on your phone um, that will show you the top, the top 26. So there's definitely no shortage of information out there. The other thing to use is the CKIS website. We have a pretty big list of our priority invasive species. And again, we'll include that later on. So the most important thing, the take home message about the Grow Me Instead is to choose um, safe alternatives to invasive species and just really knowing what you grow, being knowledgeable about that. So Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Laurie. Um, so as we go through here and we're choosing our flowers and we're avoiding invasive species, um, which there definitely are quite a few cut flowers that I see occasionally on Instagram and people's bouquets that I just think, ooh, gosh, guys, you, you shouldn't be cutting this. So it's good to be aware of that. Um, so amongst all the things that we're thinking about when we're planning our garden is how long is it going to flower in my garden? Um, We've got a few different categories here. The one hit wonder, the name pretty much says it all. Those are things like the lily. 
Um, it could be sunflowers. There's different types of sunflowers. Some are just a single stem, some are branching. Um, there's a few different things in that category. Uh, a medium producer. So these plants are like a snapdragon. They're gonna make multiple stems per plant, but they're not gonna keep producing over the course of the whole season. Um, they might, once you cut all those stems back, if you're using them in your bouquets, you might find that you'll get a second growth, like especially on a snapdragon, for example, um, but they tend to be much shorter the next, the next round. Um, and then our favorite are the cut and come again flowers. So there's quite a few in that category. They tend to be mostly the warm season annuals, um, like the zinnia is an example here. And that just means that when you cut the plant, when you cut the stem, more are going to grow. Um, it, it just, when you think about the life cycle of a plant, it wants to reproduce itself. So if you cut the flower off, that's how it makes seeds. And when you make that cut, it goes, oh no, I can't, I can't, I, I don't have anything to make a seed. So it starts generating more flowers. Um, and I showed this picture already, but we specialize in growing dahlias and dahlias are a great cut and come again flower. Um, once, you know, it does take them a while to kind of get going, but once they get started, you can see in this picture here, they, they can just bloom and bloom and bloom and they go right up until the frost. So they're obviously one of our favorites. Um, and just something to think about, we kind of touched on this already, but when you're planning your garden, you're also planning your bouquet. So you want to have a nice mix of things in there, um, you know, amongst all the different kinds of categories that we've talked about already. Um, but you want to have something, a focal flower, which is going to be sort of the central centerpiece of your your bouquet or your arrangement, some supporting flowers, like maybe the snapdragons are a good example, um, and then fillers, which could be, you know, I've got Bells of Ireland and Feverfew here, but maybe that's where you're foraging in your garden and you find mint or some ornamental oregano, things like that, that can just really fill out the bouquet and make it nice and well-rounded. And then fun things like accents. We always look for um, you know, maybe some neat grasses that we grow. We grow lots of different kinds of grains. Um, maybe this is where the poppy pods come into play, nigella, things like that that just can add some air and some interest to your bouquets. So we've talked about sort of selecting what you want to grow um, and what maybe you can grow in your area. And now we're thinking about getting ready to plant. So it sounds like everyone here already or most folks already have a garden set up so that's great um if you're looking to add maybe a new section just for cut flowers set yourself up for success location 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 right people know this you've got to you want to pick a special spot to create your cut flower garden um, and when you're making that area you want to think about you know do you have good sun but also being able to have good access to it you've got to make sure you can bring water over there and with our flowers we do a lot of trellising because there's nothing worse than having a big rainstorm or thunderstorm come through a huge wind and your flowers are just about to just start blooming and they just collapse and fall over in the rain and all your hard work is now kind of down in the ground. Um, and if you're just getting started, take your time. Um, I think this is the biggest mistake I see amongst new gardeners as people just wanting to rush into it, which I totally get because you're excited and you want to get started. But if you're starting from just a bare patch of grass and turning that into your garden, you know, take your time. The soil is the foundation of growing any good garden. So devoting yourself to doing that, while it might not feel as exciting as growing all these great flowers or veggies, take your time, make your garden, um, do what you need to do, amend the soil, add compost. Maybe you're going to grow a cover crop so you can try to get rid of, rid of all the weeds in the first year. You'll never really get rid of all of them, but you know, just to sort of have it so it's a space that's under control and it's ready for you to plant. Um, and also just being able to devote your time to it. I think that's, you know, maybe that seems obvious and all of us are here because we're keen gardeners. So that's not maybe a problem for us, but you know, really being able to devote yourself to, to doing this. Sarah, just, um, yeah. oh, sorry, just let you know, we are at the halfway mark. It's one o'clock. Um, okay. We have a handful of questions coming in just so you're aware, but yeah, just letting you know that the time. Super. Okay. Thanks. 
um, yeah, I think we're, we're moving along here pretty good. And I, I apologize if it seems like I'm throwing lots of information at everybody all at once, but it's, there's a lot to cover and we can only just kind of skim the surface on stuff. So I'm trying to just kind of move along and give you guys a good, a good foundation and a good direction to, to get started. So if you're, you're picking a spot for cut flowers, um, most of, maybe not most of probably 70% of what we grow are annuals. And for most of all the annuals that we're growing, we need a good sunny location. So pick a spot that's got plenty of sunshine. If you're tucked in the trees, I'm not an expert at landscape plants, but there's lots of things you can grow that will thrive in the shade, like maybe a still bees or hosta, things like that. Um, but if you're looking at growing a lot of these plants that we're talking about here and you see in the pictures, you've got to have a nice sunny spot. Make sure that it can be easily watered. Um, you need to have access to water. As you know, our summers can get really hot and dry, so we want to keep those plants regularly watered. Um, we use drip tape here, which is awesome. Um, it helps keep the, the moisture right down in the soil. We're not worried about if it's a bright sunny day or if it's really windy with overhead watering. You know, a lot of times the sprinkler is just kind of blowing off in the wind. Um, and then you want to look for a spot that has healthy, fertile, well-draining soil. And I realize that's more of a goal that we're working towards over the course of our gardening career. But, you know, like I said, take your time to get started. Devote some energy into creating a nice spot because the more you put into the soil, the, the better plants you're going to have. Um, and also just have, make sure that you can access it easily. Um, if you're going to be harvesting, if you're going to be trellising, you need to make sure you can easily kind of move around there. Um, and I'll hand it over to Lori here to talk about um, invasive plant control, but this is something really to think about as you're preparing a new area because you might be um, looking at a spot that has some of these plants or you also don't want to invite them to come in. Yeah, okay, thanks Sarah. Um, so yeah, like I already mentioned, prevention is uh, the best tool in our toolbox, but if you are unable to prevent invasive species from coming onto your property, you're now getting just a couple of tips. Um, there are many ways to manage and eradicate invasive species, and it's best to take um, a species appropriate approach. And again, CKIS can be a great resource for you. We do have individual tip sheets if you're dealing with like a hawkweed infestation, um, things like that, we could definitely reach out to us, look at our, spe our species profiles for actual specific species. Just you've touched on this already, definitely healthy soil. That is a great way that you can um, definitely like, stop invasive species from coming in. So do you have bare soil, compact soil? Invasive species tend to thrive on that sort of environment. So managing your soil is really important. And as well, if you are removing invasive species, digging them out, things like that, ensuring that maybe you're replanting that area with uh, really healthy um, and native plant populations so that the new seed bank kind of can't take hold, which would be great. Um, so the other part of this is the disposal of this plant material. You'll see a picture there. This is at a community poll last week of scotch broom that has taken over a park in Nelson. So if you're able to uh, deadhead your invasive plants before they go to seed, that would be really helpful to prevent the spread or, and then of course, like removing the invasive plants in general, ensuring that you're actually bagging that material. Um, so you're not putting it in your compost. Uh, you're not illegally dumping it. We're actually finding uh, at Seekiss, we do a lot of work up for our service roads and we'll people that are just dumping their garden waste on the side. If you think about it, it's a form of plant pollution and you could be introducing invasive species into a natural environment. Uh, on top of it, it's illegal and you could get some hefty fines. So that's, a, that's another reason to do it. So something to be aware of for folks in the Kootenays, um, all of our landfills within the RDCK and RDKB, they in, they accept invasive plant material free all year round. Um, the important part of this though is making sure that when you're transporting it between your home to the landfill that you're not just in the back of your truck and seeds are just flying out everywhere. Um, they will only accept it if it's in clear bags um, so they can see the material and just ensuring that um, the transport part of it um, you're not spreading it by, by driving it down. So that's a big one definitely identifying what you have on your property, trying to control it, 
really healthy soil and ensuring that you're disposing of those invasives in the proper way. And all this is on our website. And again, it will be in the resources at the end. So I will turn it back to you, Sarah. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Um, so as we're moving along here and we've chosen what plants we're going to grow and where we're going to put them, um, a really important thing here is knowing when to plant. Um, when we learn about the different kinds of plants, like the annuals, hardy annuals, etc., cetera, um, that's gonna give us a good idea of when we can plant those different things out. Um, and knowing what your climate is like, when is your last frost date is a really key thing to know because that's gonna dictate when it's safe to obviously plant out those warm season annuals that are frost tender. Um, but also knowing that date, you can kind of work backwards from there to figure out when do you want to, you know, you can see we've got a picture of um, our greenhouse from last winter or the winter before. Um, knowing that last frost date, you can kind of figure out, okay, I know four weeks before my last frost, I want to get started with some of my warm season annuals or eight weeks before that, you could get started with some of your um, hardy annuals. So here's just kind of some general guidelines for hardy annuals and perennials you can start planting those four to six weeks before your last uh, spring frost. Perennials are great, like you'll see the snow melts and a lot of things are just coming up immediately. There's green as soon as the snow melts. Same thing with the biennials. Um, the hardy annuals, they can tolerate a lot of cold usually, but you do need to be a little bit careful with when you put them out. Again, knowing your specific climate and what the weather tends to be like. Um, but they're surprisingly hardy. So um, we also will start these in the fall, um, or we'll actually be in the late summer, four to six weeks before your first frost in the fall, you can work backwards from there. Um, and then you can have a really nice succession if you plant, say, for example, the larkspur um, in the fall, then in the spring, again, you can plant that um, a second time and you can get a nice long season out of that. Um, the biennials, we tend to start those um, in our greenhouse and plant them out late summer. They're going to grow, or mid to late summer. Um, like we said, they're going to grow their leaves and roots, and then they're going to flower the next year. But you want to get them in the ground with enough time to really get growing and get established. Um, the warm season annuals, you've got to wait till after your last frost to put those in the ground. Um, we use a lot of row cover here, so you can buy a little time with that. Um, you know, you've got to be real dedicated to putting the cover on and off every night. I have a picture, I think, in the next slide where you can see um, we use what's called Rime. It's a frost blanket, um, and that just gives a little extra protection. This season, it's, we've had really cool nights all spring. So normally by now, although we could still have a frost, it's usually pretty safe to start putting these things out. I mean, we push the envelope a bit, um, but we have everything covered in Rime just about right now. We have our hardy annuals are, are outside on their own, but we have a lot of stuff that as we're planting it out, these tender little plants coming out of our greenhouse, we're covering everything at night right now. And that's the great thing about, having a mix of these different plants because right now the perennials are doing great. They're out on their own, they're loving the rain, they're getting really nice and established in the cool weather of the spring. Um, and as soon as it warms up, they're gonna just start, you know, growing like crazy. So um, it, the mix of plants is really key, I think, especially here um, to having a really successful garden and embracing the hardy annuals, the perennials, the biennials, because they can not only handle our weather, but they really thrive in our climate. Um, the list of hardy annuals, as long as I showed you the picture there earlier, but the larkspur, calendula, snapdragons, rudbeckia, all those things we planted out probably two weeks after the snow melted, we planted out little transplants and we did cover them with Rime to get them established. Right now, we still have them covered, most of them at night, although we don't have to. We're doing it just because this is how we make our livelihood, but they certainly would be fine out there on their own right now. Um, and then shrubs and trees, you can plant those in the spring or fall. And again, with the perennials, it's the same thing. I mean, really a perennial you can plant 
any time of the season. Um, but I think they do better if you plant them in the cool of either the early or the late season. So getting an early start, it's pretty key here in our area. You can definitely direct seed things out there and that's where the hardy annuals again are great because you can direct seed those in the fall. And as the snow melts, they get moisture and they'll just start popping up in the spring. Um, the warm season annuals, I recommend if you can, getting those started ahead of time. Even if it's just a couple of weeks, it gives you a nice little jump start on the season. Um, and personally, we like using transplants for almost everything. Every space in our garden is valuable as it is with most people. So just knowing that we've got that seed up and germinated um, and we know that every spot in the garden is going to be filled with a nice healthy plant. Um, so starting indoors and I said in moderation, I'm adding that in there just because I know often we can get really excited as winter is starting to come to an end and everybody wants to start plants indoors. But don't start a zinnia in February. It's going to just, they grow so quickly, it's going to outgrow its pot. You're not doing yourself any favors. You're actually going to set that plant back by starting it too soon. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, you can see in the photos here, um, we use a a variety of different kinds of hoops. This is actually conduit here, but we also just use a thick gauge wire and we just bend it in an arch and stick it in the ground um, on, you know, push it down into the ground on either side of our bed. And then we cover it with this reme or um, frost blanket. It just adds a nice little bit of extra protection, especially if you're starting with transplants, it also just protects them from the wind and you know they're coming out of this very nurturing, safe environment in the greenhouse and it's a nice way to kind of introduce them to, to the outdoors, so to speak. Um, and yeah, again, another tip for getting an early start is to fall sow or fall plant perennials, biennials, and those hardy annuals. Um, and then, to have that early start also incorporating all the different kinds of plants including bulbs you want to plant a lot of the bulbs you plant in the fall and as i'm sure you've seen as soon as the snow melts you've got your tulips and your daffodils and snowdrops and all kinds of things coming up um, so when you're getting ready to plant um, lots of you probably already know this but i think it's a critical point here to make sure when you're planting out that your soil is not bone dry, go ahead and give it a little bit of a watering beforehand. Um, and then when you put the plants in, give them water immediately. Um, most of our plants we put at nine to 12 inch spacing. You can see in our rows here. Um, if you're growing cut flowers, it's okay to have them crowded a bit. It actually helps encourage them to grow longer stems. You don't wanna have them crowded so tightly that the plants are gonna suffer. Um, if they're too packed in there, they're just not going to be as healthy. Um, and if you're doing any direct seeding, keep in mind that you need to be thinning those out. I often, when I'm direct seeding, will put a few seeds in each hole just because I want to make sure I've got something there. But if three or four pop up, it's going to do a lot better if you just thin it down to one. Caring for your garden. Um, regular watering. This might seem like an obvious thing here, but it's so important in our area it gets hot, it gets dry, you want to keep those plants moist. This is where using mulch can be really helpful. Um, we, you can't see in, in this picture, we're kind of just opening up a new area, but we are working on doing no-till, so we wood chip all of our paths. Um, we do use some straw and hay for mulch, although you do have to be a little bit careful with that because it can have a lot of weed seeds in it. Um, but even adding a thick layer of compost on top, that can help retain some moisture. It's good fertilizer to an extent, and it also can be really good for helping suppress weeds. Um, so regular watering, regular fertilizing. As gardeners, we are basically mining the soil. So it's great when we can take all that plant matter and compost it and put it back into our garden. But when you think about it, if we're growing vegetables or even flowers, that that cabbage that we're harvesting off there, we, we've drawn out of the soil bank, so to speak, and we want to make sure we're always replenishing. We do a lot of fertilizing with um, like a fish and a seaweed blend, um, but there's lots of options, organic options out there. And just keeping your garden as weed-free-ish as you can. Cultivating by hand, 
pulling them out, and then again, using mulch um, is a great way to keep your garden weed free. And it makes it more enjoyable for you down the road. You don't go look out to the garden and go, oh no, it's a project. You want it to be a joyful experience. Um, and I wanted to share with you, we use a lot of landscape fabric. This is a thick woven fabric that we burn holes into. It also helps us keep our plants perfectly spaced so they can kind of get that optimal, optimal growth range. Um, it's, we can use it year after year. We have some that we've been using for five or six seasons. It holds up really well. It's breathable. Water can go through it. Um, and you just kind of secure it down to the ground with ground staples. Um, and just as you're thinking about your cut flower garden, some extra bits of maintenance that might not be the same as your regular veggie garden is being able to trellis plants. Um, you can kind of see in this picture of the larkspur, there's some stakes here. Um, we use either a horizontal netting that's basically just like a grid that goes horizontally over the bed or we'll use stakes and we'll actually just take twine and wrap it all the way around and, and kind of corral those plants in. And that's probably what we're doing here with the larkspur. And we might have to do that um, multiple layers up because as you can see, like the larkspur are probably close to five feet tall. Um, pinching, mm -hmm. this is something I'll definitely, if you guys follow us on social media, I'll. I've had a lot of questions about this and I'll show you guys later and once things are actually growing how to do this, but to have a really nice plant for cutting, you really want to pinch the center out. We, when the plant's about eight to 12 inches tall, we go and we just take the growing tip out and we do this with nearly everything we grow. There are some exceptions. If it's a one hit wonder, don't do that because you just took the flower off like a lily. Um, it's not gonna branch if you cut it. But with most things, if you cut that growing tip out, it will encourage the plant to branch and you'll get a lot more stems. And you'll also get longer stems, better for cutting. With a lot of things, if you don't pinch that center out, you'll get one big bloom on the top and it will branch. You could get lots of flowers off of it, but they're gonna be just kind of short they're going to be difficult to use in bouquets if that's what you want to do. And then deadheading. Um, you know, this is maybe more in a home garden. It might not be as critical, but again, when you think about how the plant works, if you keep those flowers deadheaded, it will encourage it to make more blooms. And then just real quickly, I wanted to talk about harvesting because that is sort of the ultimate goal here once you grow this beautiful garden is to be able to pick flowers at the end especially here in the summer when it's really hot cut early in the morning get up early and just do it right away um, it makes a world of difference the flowers will last a lot longer some of this other stuff might seem really obvious but be diligent about it use clean snips clean them at the end of every day um, you can you just even soap and water is fine. Um, clean snips and a clean vase or bucket and then remove the lower foliage when you're putting it in water. Basically if it's in the water you don't want there to be foliage there that's where bacteria and things can grow. It will contaminate the water and that makes your flowers um, not last as long. And lastly we always let our flowers just sit and rest in the water before we actually start arranging them. It allows them to hydrate and kind of drink up that water. It makes them stronger and it really does make them last longer in the vase. And so that's, uh, that's about the end of it here. Um, we were just only able to kind of scratch the surface on this, but if you're interested in learning more, um, please feel free to email us some questions. We're super busy right now. It's springtime, it's Mother's Day. There's everything in the world to get done. Um, so I'll try to answer your questions. If I can't answer them immediately though, it might be a great thing that kind of pushes us in a direction to know what people are interested in learning. And maybe we can do a post on it later or even another future talk next year. Um, and definitely follow along if you're into social media on um, what we're doing there because we do often post things about how we do what we do here. Um, and if we get questions, that's a great place too that we can talk to more than one person at a time and kind of let them know what our, what our techniques are there. 
So I think I'll pass it over to Lori here for a minute. Awesome. Okay, Sarah, it looks like we do have about 12 questions to get to. Okay. Um, I can with that. Before we do that, I just do need to thank our sponsors um, who do support the CKIS education program. So a big shout out to Columbia Basin Trust, as well the province of BC. Um, there's two funding streams through the BC Gaming Grant, as well through the Ministry of Forest Land, Natural Resources, and Rural Development. So a big thank you to our funders. Um, that allow us to do outreach um, like this. And if you want to hit the next slide there, Sarah, we may leave this one up as the... And if you're looking for more information, just a reminder to check your inbox. We are going to do a follow-up email with uh, some of these resources, as well um, the, our website, seekus.ca, for any invasive species, what actions you can take in your garden. It's all on our website as well. Um, check out Sarah's website for Stone Meadow Gardens. So I'm going to jump to some questions here for you, Sarah. Um, we are at 121. Are you okay maybe staying on for like 10 or 15 more minutes to yeah. try to get through some questions? Okay. So let's see. Sorry. Um, so the first one is, I'm not from, this is from Samantha. I'm not familiar with quorums. What is the difference between the three? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, basically, a quorum is just a... I mean, a lot of people call it a bulb. It's a bulb-like structure that's basically the the underground root system of a plant. Um, like I said, it tends to be bulb-like, um, although some of them are pretty funky shapes. It's not like a typical when you think of a bulb. I think we probably mostly think of like a tulip bulb. Um, and it's just the way that some plants are propagated. So we, like our ranunculus that we grow, those are from a corm. Um, and those are something that, you know, we dig them out every season because they're not hardy enough and store them in our basement. Okay. Next question is from Karen, and I, I'm going to potentially butcher the pronunciation of this, sorry. So do you have to dig up anemone corms? A-N-E-M. Oh, an 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 anemone. Anemone? Yeah. <laughs> <Thank> yeah. <you. laughs> Um, so the answer is it depends. Um, for the showier cut flower types, they technically are not hardy here, although we have often had lots of them survive, you know, when we've dug them up, sometimes you miss a piece here and there. We've had them make it through the winter, but they don't thrive. Um, there are different types of anemones and some are perennial. Um, I don't have the, the, the species name on the top of my head right now, but what we're thinking of for the an anemone corms, you do want to dig those up. And we find that we let, you know, they thrive right now. They love the spring, the early kind of cool temperatures. Um, you let them grow. <laughs> let the foliage in the summer, it will completely die back, quit watering them. And then late summer is when we dig them up. And then we literally just like, we make sure they are dry when we dig them. Um, and we just put them in crates or bags and store them in our cool basement until we're ready to sprout them again the next um, spring or like late winter. Okay. So next question is asking, is our growing area 5A? It's really gonna depend where you are. Like Rosland is way different than where we are here near Castlegar. So we're a five, I think we're considered a 5B here. Um, you know, but even Nelson, if you're right by the lake, it's a tiny bit warmer. So you can look at, um, if you even just type into Google like hardiness zone maps, um, you can get a good idea for what your zone is, but I think generally speaking, this area is probably around a five, but again, it, it is going to vary, you know, Kimberly or Cranbrook might, might be a lot different than we are here. Okay. And we have a question from Sharon. She's hoping you can address proper overwinter storage of tubers. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> It depends what you're talking about. Probably, I'm assuming she's talking about dahlia tubers. Um, and basically, you want to harvest those, obviously, before winter comes. Um, you're going to cut them back all the way 
cut the the stock back I, I do have something on our website where i go like pretty in depth on this but again this is something that everyone has a different opinion about what's the right way to do it um it's kind of like what works for you basically but ultimately you don't want them to be too warm or too cold right around like 10 c is about the right temperature um cooler on the cooler side seems to be better um you want to store them in typically in some kind of a media like we've used wood shavings we've used vermiculite we've used peat moss um basically it's kind of like the goldilocks situation where it's like not too hot not too cold not too wet not too dry um we found that here it tends to be pretty dry in the winter even though we have lots of snow like the air is really dry so i think most people in our area have more issues with them drying out and shriveling up so storing them in a closed container we've actually started using um like a plastic shoe box after we harvest them we clean them off we actually wash all ours first and then we'll pack them in vermiculite in a plastic shoe box um at, at, we do let the tubers dry out a bit um, and then we pack them into those boxes and store them in usually our basement which maintains a really nice like between eight and ten degrees so but like i said there is an article on our website about that where i go into a bit more depth about it uh, next question is how deep should the soil be for the rows? How deep should your soil be for the like rows R O W S or R O S E? <laughs> R O W S. <laughs> um you know, I think you have to work with what you've got. Um we don't till anymore. We are doing a no-till program here. So we actually sold our rototiller. We do use a, a broad fork, which is basically like a large garden fork to loosen our soil sometimes. But we, our main goal is we don't want to invert it. Um, you want to just keep adding to your soil so you can build it up and make it healthier. Um, I guess it, it's probably pretty specific to your particular location like if you have a really shallow soil that I don't know are you on rocky soil or really heavy clay it's kind of hard to say there um, but you know typically when we're going to plant our transplants we want to make sure it's it's loose enough it doesn't need to be super fluffy lofty post rototilled soil because if it's like that, it can just condense down as soon as you start watering it. Um, but basically we wanna have it loose enough so that we can get our transplants in there really. And we usually try to plant um, because we have so many things to plant. We want it to be actually loose enough that we are just like able to use our hands or we use a small, um, actually like a, a chisel to just kind of draw the soil back and pop our plugs in there. Okay. Uh, next, next question, where can you purchase drip tape? Okay, um, locally, I think that you can get it at Nelson Farmer Supply. Um, that's about the only place I know in the immediate area that carries like the same sort of stuff that we use. If you have a smaller garden, you could look into using like a soaker hose type of situation where if you have like a more permanent setup um, and you know, maybe you've got a four foot by 10 foot bed or something like that, you could get a couple lengths of soaker hose and hook those up together so that you can just turn that on and water it all at once. I think drip is a great way to go for this area because we are so dry, it, it really keeps the moisture right down at the roots. Um, and like I said, it, it doesn't matter if it's windy or sunny, you can still water. Um, but yeah, ch check Nelson Farm Supply. Okay. Okay, and Nancy is wondering, she says, I have many tulips growing very closely together. When and how should I thin them and replant? Okay. Um, I guess it depends what type of tulips you have. Obviously, you've got some that are nice and naturalizing. Um, wait until after all the foliage dies back. I think you could do it even in the summertime. You know, they're up and happening right now. 
let them go through this cycle. And once the foliage dies back, I think then you're safe to start digging them up and you'll see all the little offsets of the bulbs and you can just spread those out. And, um, you know, often people do, I guess, dig them up in the summer, store them in your basement for a little while and then get them back out there in like September. Okay. Um, do you test your soil and then amend the soil? That's a great question. Absolutely. Um, we highly recommend doing a soil test because that's the only real way that you'll know what you should be adding to your soil. And often I think people can over fertilize when it's really not necessary. If you know exactly what you do need, then it, you don't need to waste money adding something that you maybe don't need to use. Um, you know, for the home gardener, that might be a bit more of an expense. I, I don't recommend using like you can go to the garden centers around here and buy like a little kit, but I just don't know how accurate that is. We send our soil to a place called back, um, sorry, down to earth labs and they're in Alberta and you can just dig up, you know, they give you the instructions of how to do it. Um, but it gives you a lot of information about your soil. You can check your micronutrients, your organic matter, your cation exchange, all that kind of stuff. And that can really help guide you to, to what you should be adding. Okay. And next question is what is deadheading and do you pinch the center of a flower? Yes. Okay. So deadheading is just removing any of the, the spent blooms or, you know, maybe often here we might have something that blooms and maybe it got a little bit damaged or, you know, maybe an insect was going after it and it just wasn't quite good enough to pick for a cut flower. Um, you just go ahead and chop that bloom off. Basically, that's what deadheading is, is just removing the flower um, and pinching. I really, I wish I had a plant here in front of me to show you, but that's where you're just going down and pinching out the growing center of the plant. Basically, each plant typically has, you know, the leaves grow in sets up the stem. So you want to leave two or three sets of leaves. And then right at the top, you're just going to pinch that out right above um, a leaf set and that's what's going to help make that plant branch and also when you're thinking about cutting when you're actually ready to start picking those flowers you want to cut as low and deep as you can because usually where you cut is where the plant is going to branch again so if you kind of just cut the top off and even when you're deadheading that's something to think about just go ahead and cut it like you would as if you were cutting it for a bouquet um, depending on the flower sometimes if you just cut that top off it'll just decide to branch again right there and it'll make a couple new little flowers um but if you want to encourage those long stems for bouquets that's right i recommend just cutting deep in there so i hope i hope that kind of answered that one okay great uh so louise is wondering she's asking how long do you hydrate flowers before arranging does it vary with different types of flowers it does um typically we'll let everything rest for at least an hour usually two or more um and there certainly are different techniques with different types of flowers um something like a hydrangea a lot or you know anything that's in the woody kind of area those can tend to be a little bit trickier um and you often will slice up the stem, like make a nice deep cut, like right in the middle of the, the bottom of the stem, you'll kind of cut it in half um, and that'll help hydrate. Um, there's other things like even some of the herbs and honeywort is one that we grow that, or um, Icelandic poppies. We actually dip the stems into boiling water after we cut them and that allows them to hydrate better. Um, it's, there's, it's a big topic, like there's a lot of different techniques for different flowers, but you know, probably 80% is just cut it in the morning, let it sit in your bucket and, and don't leave it in the sun, put it in the shade, put it someplace safe. If you, are, if you have a basement you can work in, that's awesome. Um, but keep it cool and keep it out of the sun and let it sit for an hour or two and then you're good to go. 
Okay, so we're going to do three more questions, Sarah, if you're okay. <laughs> people sure, want to pick your brain. <laughs> Some people in the chat box saying how amazing you are as well. So thank ah. you. <laughs> okay, sorry, I lost where I was here. Okay, here we go. So you meant, you just mentioned Icelandic poppies. So someone's asking, can you please tell me about Icelandic poppies? When do you start them and when is it okay to transplant? Okay. Um, Typically, we start those in the winter. We have overwintered some that we actually planted in the fall. We've kind of had moderate success with that. Um, but typically, we'll start them in our greenhouse. Um, don't put them on a heat mat. They, they don't need to be extra warm. Um, in probably February-ish. And really, when you should start them, the more important thing to know is when can you plant them out? Um, some people, if you have snow on the ground until April 15th, well, you need to kind of work backwards from that date. So usually here we're safe by around April 1st, although the last couple of years it's been like the 8th or something. We still have snow on the ground and we're literally like shoveling snow off to start planting. Um, but work backwards from that date go maybe about six weeks or so back from the, so they're a, they're a hardy annual they can take um they can take a lot of cold weather so figure that time there that you can you know start with your frost date i guess and you could work back six weeks from there and then work back another six weeks and that's when you should start your seeds six to eight weeks later you can plant them in the ground they can take a lot of cold um, we do still like to cover stuff just to give it that little extra bit of protection, um, but they are quite hardy. And then once they start blooming, they're really, they can be really prolific. And then we do pick them in just the, the cracking bud stage where the sheath has kind of released and popped open. You can see the color in there. That's the perfect time to cut them. And then yes, you do either, um, sear the stems with a torch actually or dip them in boiling water you just have to dip the bottom bit and you'll see it actually change color um and you, you hold it in there for like 10 seconds it, it you kind of feel like am i really supposed to be doing this but yes you are <laughs> <laughs> okay next question i'm gonna butcher these uh species names again so forgive me <laughs> all you gardeners out there um, so Catherine's wanting, wondering, do you treat, oh God, <laughs> you can do it. Ran... You spell it? what's that? R-A-N-U-N-C, ranunculus, ranunculus, thank you, yeah. forms the same way as an animums, anemones, quite similar, yes, yep, same thing of um, when we're, because we do keep them from year to year um let them go through their cycle uh once it starts warming up they'll bloom like crazy and then that's it they don't like the really hot weather so let the foliage die back then we quit watering them we let it dry out you wouldn't know that there's even a plant there anymore often it's like that died back um and then yeah we try to do it late summer but sometimes it's not until almost fall and then we dig them up make sure they're dry and we just store them in like rubbermaid totes in our basement and they growing them is harder than storing them they're actually really quite easy to keep um over the winter and they, they just are dry little nubs <laughs> and they it's amazing how they can come back to life Right. Okay. Last question, Sarah. Um, can you transplant lupins now in the spring if they are just starting to show? Um, I guess I'm not sure if they're thinking about transplanting them, like digging it up and transplanting it. Um, I'm not sure. It's not sure. It's You're still on the call. The call. Yourself or take or take. Because I would say the only thing with lupins is that. Uh, maybe you could like you certainly could be planting out something that you had started you know in your house or in your greenhouse but right now this is their time to kind of shine and I think 
they're growing really fast right now, I think you probably could get, you could do it, but you might not get a great flower if that's what you're hoping for. Yeah, she, she, yeah, she, 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 she of like to, di to that she's thinking about digging it up and moving it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I certainly think you could. I don't think you would kill it, but I just don't know if it's like the optimal time to do it. Okay. Great. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, we're gonna. Oh, 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 I don't know the feedback. Feedback. Sorry. Um. So once uh, again, so once again, joining. Joining. I have, I have the marigolds. Marigolds here. here. I'm my husband the garden. I'm some beautiful cut flowers. Cut flowers. Um. And it's and it's so much. Everyone for everyone for joining. Remember when you're out. Remember when you're out doing very plant walks. So check your inbox, check your inbox and just email, and just email so and, 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 and you'll have a chance to read Lots of positive Lots comments. Of positive and positive comments and thank, you, Sarah, thank you, Sarah, for your excellent. And happy gardening to everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody.